so good evening, everyone. Thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules to attend the fourth preclinical med revision lecture series. And this is another legendary collaboration, um, this time with the president and vice president of the Melbourne University Gastrointestinal Society, or MUGIS for short. Um, Sean Chu and Reese Ansar, respectively, both distinguished MB3 students uh, placed at the Royal Melbourne Hospital affiliated with the Melbourne Medical School. Um, I am Alex, a second year Melbourne student at the Epworth. And, and before we begin, I would like to humbly acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, uh, the wandering people of the Kulin nations. Uh, I would like to pay my respects to um, elders past, present, and emerging, as well as to those of uh, First Nations or Torres Strait Islander descent that may be listening. And I will also like to pay additional appreciation for them to take care of this land that both uh, domestic and fellow international students such as myself are able to learn and pursue our various endeavors. Um, thank you so much to the prior Teaching for Impact people for um, sort of the slides. And also thank you for Sean and Reese for taking time out of their schedules to teach us. And without further ado, um, take it from the bridge. All right. Well, thanks, Alex. That was a uh, pretty good introduction. So, yeah, um, we're Mugis and we're the first GI society in Melbourne Uni um, that amalgamates both the surgical and internal aspect of medicine. So join us and you can look forward to amazing events next year. All right, let's begin. <laughs> Struggling with anatomy? We got you covered. <laughs> All right, let's begin. So, um, quadrants and regions of the abdomen, all right? So the anterior abdominal wall can be divided into quadrants or regions as shown in the diagram. So quadrants basically draw a vertical line from the xiphoid process right here, and then all the way down to the pubic symphysis. That's when you get the median line. And then you draw a horizontal line um, through the umbilicus, it's called the trans umbilical plane. That's when you get four quadrants, right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, right lower quadrant, and left lower quadrant. You can also divide the um, GI system in, um, into um, nine regions, where you draw two vertical lines corresponding to the right and left midclavicular lines, and draw two horizontal lines corresponding to the subcostal and the intertubercular line. So you get nine, nine quadrants in this area. And the reason why we do that is because it's just easier to locate like the area of pain where the, where the individual is experiencing. Now, let's just go through some high yield but basic anatomy. All right, so our GIT, nine meters long, um, starts from your mouth all the way to your anal canal. Now, the GIT can be split into foregut, midgut, and hindgut. And remember that the three branches coming up from the front of the abdominal aorta are the select trunk the superior mesenteric artery and the inferior mesenteric artery. Now, the foregut consists of structures from the distal area of your esophagus all the way down to the proximal duodenum, including the liver, gallbladder, pancreas, and spleen. The foregut is supplied by the select trunk. The midgut now starts from the distal duodenum to the proximal two-third of the transverse colon, and this is supplied by the superior mesenteric artery. Now, last but not least, you've got the hindgut, which, is, which starts from the distal one third of the transverse colon all the way down to the rectum. This is supplied by the inferior mesenteric artery. Now, interestingly, as you can see from the middle illustration, that green line there, the GIT can be um, divided into upper GI and lower GI. The demarcation point is the ligament of treats, okay? It's also known as the suspensory muscle of the duodenum. So what is this? It's actually an extension of the right cruise muscle from the di diaphragm, right? Coming together with the fibromuscular band of the smooth muscle from the duodenum seen. And the reason why we divide the GIT is so that we can identify the source of pathology. For example, upper GI bleed, okay? You've got your coffee ground, vomit, and your melina. I know this is pretty unsightly. And the reason why when you get bleeds in upper GI, especially in your tummy region, is that um, the iron in your blood is very caustic. So the way your body just reacts is just by vomiting out. 
Okay, and the reason why is this weird coffee ground color is because your stomach acid just kind of mixes around with um, the uh, blood, hence giving it such coloration. Now, you've got your melina, which is a black, tarry, sticky, foul smelling stool. And you could actually use a gastroscopy to diagnose this procedure. I can tell you one thing, when a patient comes in with like melina you, or, or severe intestinal blockage they can actually vomit fecal metal out yeah and you can actually smell them from like quite a distance now there's a lower gi bleed which is um what you'll find is hematochesia which is blood in stool as you can see by now just warning you the next picture is a bit graphic there you go <laughs> yeah so basically uh in patients with lower gi bleed you do a colonoscopy where you insert from the anal canal all the way up through the colon to the cecum to visualize the entire colon to see where's the source of bleed. Now, esophagus, 25 centimeters long, and it starts from your C6, okay? Cricoid cartilage, descends all the way down to your midline, superior metastinum, okay? Right behind the trachea, and it then pierces the diaphragm at T10. Now, after piercing the diaphragm, it tends to turn a bit to the left and joins the cardiac orifice of the stomach. Histologically, the esophagus has an unusual muscularis propria, which contains a mixture of skeletal muscle and smooth muscle. Now, in the top one third of the esophagus, its main skeletal muscle predominates. In the middle section, middle one third, it's both skeletal muscle and smooth muscle. In the distal part of the esophagus, it's mainly smooth muscles. Now, at the gastroesophageal junction, as his name suggests, gastro, stomach, esophageal, esophagus, where it meets, it's called the Z line. And there is a sharp transition from stratified squamous epithelium uh, lining the esophagus to a simple columnar epithelium lining the stomach. If you know by now, anything that's secretory is usually columnar, okay? Now, a bit more about the esophagus. You have three sites of narrowing, the cervical region, and this is also known as the upper esophageal sphincter. This is a true anatomical sphincter, okay? And the thoracic region is the second area of narrowing. And no, this is not a sphincter, okay? This is just an area, area of narrowing when the esophagus is sandwiched between the aortic arch and the left main bronchus. It's just an area of narrowing. And lastly, we've got your abdominal region. This is known as the physiological sphincter as the right and left crooks kind of hooks around it. Now, the anatomical sphincter, what's the difference between an anatomical sphincter and a physiological sphincter? I'll break it down for you. An an anatomical sphincter is both uh, visible to our eyes, and it can be felt when you actually touch it, it's like a thickened circular muscle, hence reducing the luminal size, acting as a sphincter. Physiological sphincter, on the other hand, is formed by the normal circular muscle, but it acts like a sphincter by the process of muscle contraction and relaxation. Now, at the gastroesophageal junction, also called the Z-line, um, as I mentioned before, there's a transition from um, stratified squamous to simple columnar. Now let's go through some common pathologies. Firstly, achalasia. What's achalasia? Achalasia is a primary esophageal motility disorder, movement disorder, characterized by the absence of esophageal peristalsis and impact relaxation or increased tone of the lower esophageal sphincter. Because it is, a uh, it is a functional disorder, patient experience dysphagia which, uh, for both solids and liquids. Now, as you can see from here, for the MD2s and above, and MD1s as well, this is also known as a red tail sign, okay? So you basically get the patient to, to swallow, okay? Some form of contrast. And as you can see, it shouldn't be so tight over here where the arrow is pointed. Now, Achalasia is associated with an increased risk of esophageal cancer. Next pathology we'll talk about is gastroesophageal reflux disease. What exactly is it? It's primarily caused by inappropriate transient relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. But there are many other causes as well, such as smoking, caffeine, alcohol consumption, obesity, pregnancy, and even sliding hiatal hernia, as I'll explain later. Now, patients with gourd commonly present with heartburn, okay, water brush, which is excessive uh, salivation, and dysphagia, okay. God can also present with chronic cough because there's a lot of irritation and hoarseness due to laryngo, larynx, pharyngeal reflux, okay. Now, 
In patients with gout, the acidic gastric content can cause irritation to the esophagus, hence causing reflux esophagitis. If chronic gout, okay, if chronic gout, then it can lead to Barrett's esophagus, which involves the replacement of the, remember when I first mentioned the stratified squamous epithelium, now to an intestinal epithelium, which is a non-ciliated columnar epithelium with goblet cells at the Z junction. Now the Barrett's esophagus is associated with high risk of esophageal adenocarcinoma, adenocarcinoma secretory. So esophageal cancer, typically presents with first, okay, this is really how you, esophageal cancer presents with first progressive dysphagia. So it's usually fluid, uh, solids first, then uh, liquids, okay? And finally, weight loss. Now, esophageal cancer has an aggressive cause due to the lack of serosa in the esophageal wall, allowing for rapid extension. And there are two types, two types of esophageal cancer. Firstly, squamous cell carcinoma, which mainly affects the upper two thirds of esophagus, okay? Main risk factors, smoking, alcohol versus adenocarcinoma, which affects the lower one third of your esophagus, okay? Uh, main causes alcohol, obesity, and chronic uh, gastroesophageal reflux, as well as Barrett esophagus. Now, let's talk about diaphragmatic hernia. Diaphragmatic hernia is when abdominal structures herniate upwards, okay? Through the diaphragm into the thorax, okay? There must be an opening. It can occur both in neonates, which is newborns, as well as adults. In neonates, it's usually due to a developmental defect of the diaphragm, hence allowing abdominal viscera content to herniate. In adults, it can be due to injury to the area, a rise in your belly, a pressure rise in the belly, such as pregnancy, obesity, chronic coughing, or straining in the toilet that causes you know, a constant increase of intra-abdominal pressure. The most common type of diaphragmatic hernia is the hiatal hernia which is when the stomach just herniates upwards through the esophagus, okay, at the level of T10. Now, there are two types of um, hiatal hernia. First type, the commonest one would be sliding hiatal hernia. Okay, in sliding hiatal hernia, the gastric cardia slides outwards and directly into the esophageal hiatus, resulting in displacement of the gastroesophageal junction upward. Or you can get the rarer one, paraesophageal hiatal hernia. Para, right next to it. Esophagus, esophagus, right? So it just moves right next to the esophagus, all right? But in this situation, in the paraesophageal hiatal hernia, the gastroesophageal junction is usually normal. The next pathology I'd like to talk about is Mallory Weiss syndrome for you alcoholics out there. Uh, basically, Mallory Weiss syndrome is a partial thickness, longitudinal. Can you see from the picture a longitudinal laceration of the gastroesophageal junction um, confined to the mucosa or submucosa? Okay. And it's usually due to um, forceful vomiting. From my understanding, usually the first vomit is okay. It's the second bout of vomit that causes hematemesis. Now, Mallory Weiss syndrome is usually found in alcoholics and bulimics. Now, the last condition I'd like to talk about is your Boo Harvey syndrome. Ooh. So now we spoke about Mallory Weiss uh, affecting the mucosa and submucosa, but in Boo Harvey, there's just transmural rupture. So the entire thing is just ruptured. Now for the MD2s and above, I think it's important for you to know this. There's this thing called the Meckless triad, which is associated with um, Boo Harvey syndrome, where you get vomiting or retching, like the acting of vomiting severe retrosternal pain and subcutaneous emphysema. For the MD ones who are wondering what the hell is subcutaneous emphysema, is basically under your skin, there is air. Another cause of subcutaneous emphysema is this post-op, okay, complication. Now, if you're feeling overwhelmed, we've only just covered the esophagus, but don't worry, we'll get through this, okay? Now, the stomach. Um, the stomach is a dilated part of our GIT, situated primarily in the left upper quadrant. It has two openings, the cardiac orifice, as well as the pyloric orifice, orifice, two curvatures, lesser curvature, and the outer greater curvature, along with two surfaces again, anterior and posterior. Now, the stomach can be divided into parts. The pylorus is a funnel-shaped um, uh, part of the stomach, and it has a cone-shaped mouth with a narrow stem. The cone-shaped mouth of the funnel is called the pyloric antrum, okay? The narrow stem of the funnel is called the pyloric canal. The pyloric sphincter is actually, if you think about it, a muscular wall of the pyloric canal. Hence, it is a true anatomical sphincter, right? As earlier mentioned. And it controls the um, outflow of gastric content into the duodenum. The stomach also consists of a body, also known as a corpus. And the fundus 
So basically what's the, the, the body? The body is basically the fundus, which is continuous with the body and it extends all the way from the cardiac orifice to the angular notch. And this is where, um, at the angular notch, this is where the body then becomes the pyloric entry. The fundus um, situated superiorly of the stomach is just a dome-shaped uh, part where, you know, usually gas just builds up when you drink gassy drinks and stuff. That's where it accumulates, okay? Now, stomach is usually intraperitoneal, which means it's surrounded by a visceral peritoneum and is connected to the abdominal wall by double full peritoneum. The generic name for double full peritoneum is mesentery, but mesentery associated specifically with the stomach is called an omentum. Okay, so now let's talk about the lesser omentum and the greater omentum. Aha. Uh -huh. So the lesser omentum basically tethers the stomach to the visceral surface of the liver. Now there are two ligaments, the hepatogastric ligament, so hepato liver gastric stomach. So hepatogastric ligament, which starts from the lesser curvature to the undersurface, the visceral surface of the liver. There is the hepatododenal ligament, which attaches the first inch of the duodenum to the visceral surface of the liver. And this is on the lesser curvature, okay? Now let's think of the greater curvature where the greater momentum is. There are three parts. So first, there's the gastrophrenic ligament. It's the most proximal part of the curvature and it starts off in basically, um, what do you call it? Um, attaches the fundus to the undersurface of the diaphragm, gastro, stomach, phrenic, diaphragm. Secondly, gastrolyenal or gastrosplenic ligament. It basically attaches from the middle part of the greater curvature, surrounds the spleen, and then attaches itself to the posterior wall overlying the kidney, okay? And lastly, we've got your fatty apron. The fatty apron is actually pretty interesting. It goes all the way down and then back up over the top of the transverse colon and attaches to the posterior abdominal wall. So I'm just going to repeat again, okay? So lesser omentum, you've got a hepatogastric, you've got a hepatododenal uh, ligament, and then for the greater omentum, you've got your gastrophrenic, gastrosplenic ligament, and then followed by your fatty apron. Now, let's focus on the architecture of the stomach itself. It is lying internally with rugae, and this helps with expansion of the stomach after consumption of food and liquids. The stomach is also consists of three types of muscles, longitudinal layer, circular layer, and an oblique layer. This is when it's high yield. Let's talk about the common pathologies of the stomach. So acute gastritis, basically, is just acute inflammation of the stomach, and it can cause, and it can cause formation of gastric erosion, which is basically a partial loss of gastric mucosa. And this can progress to the formation of gastric ulcer, which is full thickness loss of gastric mucosa. Now, acute gastritis is commonly caused by NSAIDs, which inhibits COX, which then inhibits production of PGE2, which is prostaglandin E2. Reduced PGE2 leads to the reduction of gastric mucosa protection, which results in erosion. Makes perfect sense, yeah? Now, if that's acute, there'll be chronic gastritis. Now, chronic gastritis, two main causes. H. pylori or autoimmune gastritis. Now, what's H. pylori? H. pylori is basic, H. pylori basically is the commonest cause of chronic gastritis. It affects usually the antrum first and then spreads all the way to the body of the stomach. For the MD2s onwards, there's this thing called the triple therapy to treat H. pylori. So you remember amoxicillin, clarithromycin, and PPI. All right. Next, the second cause of chronic gastritis is autoimmune gastritis. In autoimmune gastritis, you get autoantibodies being produced against the H plus, uh, H plus K plus um, ATPase found on parietal cells in the body, as well as on the fundus of the stomach. Parietal cells are responsible for, if you know by now, producing acid and intrinsic factor, which plays a critical role in the absorption of vitamin B12. Hence, autoimmune destruction of parietal cells results in reduced stomach acid secretion. Okay, and this leads to hypergastrinemia, a high gastrin um, uh, concentration in the blood and G cell hyperplasia. Additionally, the loss of intrinsic factors causes vitamin B12 deficiency leading to pernicious anemia. Then the second pathology of the stomach, peptic, peptic ulcer disease. Now peptic ulcer disease can also occur in the stomach, uh, can occur in the stomach known as a gastric ulcer or the duodenum known as a duodenal ulcer. And the most common cause of both a gastric ulcer and a duodenal ulcer is H. pylori. The second commonest cause is NSAIDs. And the third commonest cause is the Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. So what is Zollinger-Ellison syndrome? It's basically a gastrinoma cancer, okay? 
um, that is secretory and it causes hypersecretion of gastrin, okay, resulting in hypersecretion of acid. Pretty straightforward, eh? Lastly, um, gastric ulcer is associated with an increased risk of gastric cancer, whereas in the dodinal ulcer, it's usually benign. Now, this is just for um, extra information for the MD1s, but crucial for the MD2s and the Food worsens gastric ulcer symptoms, but relieves dodinal ulcer symptoms. If you think about it, when you eat food, there will be increased uh, acid production, eh? There you go. Now, lastly, let's talk about gastric cancer. The most common type of gastric cancer is gastric adenocarcinoma. Gastric adenocarcinoma has early aggressive spread with lymph node and liver metastasis. Um, so for the MD2s and above, the lymph node um, that gastric adenoma commonly metastasizes to is usually known, is usually at the left clavicle, uh, clavicle is known as the Virchow's node, okay? So now let's move on. Dodinum, all right. Small intestines. We begin with the dodinum. It's 10 inches long, C-shaped, and wraps around the head of the pancreas. Every single part of the dodinum, except about the first inch, is retroperitoneal. Remember, I told you about the dodinal hepatic ligament from the first inch of the, um, the, do the first part of the dodinum? That's right. So the course of the dodinum is very straightforward. It starts off on the right psoas muscle, okay, and traverses across the left psoas muscle. This, this means it has to pass the IVC, which is the inferior vena cava, and then the abdominal aorta, which is, makes perfect sense because they run next to each other. Now, let's talk about the parts of um, the, uh, what do you call it, dodinum. So the first part of the dodinum is called the dodinal cap, and it's two inches long, okay? So the dodinal cap is a direct continuation of the tubular GIT beyond the pyloric canal. Now, stomach is intraperitoneal, the first inch of the two inch dodinal cap is intraperitoneal. The second inch onwards all the way on is retroperitoneal, okay? And remember, the dodinal cap is the most common site for dodinal ulcers. The acidic chyme from the stomach goes directly into the dodinal cap. If the pancreas does not release enough bicarbonate to neutralize the acidic chyme, the acid will erode the wall of the dodinal cap, hence producing dodinal ulcers, okay? So the dodinal cap goes upwards, backwards and down on the right cruise, um, or lying on the right cruise of the muscle and the right, uh, right cruise of the muscle of the diaphragm and right psoas muscle. The second part of the dodinum, three inches long, okay? It is just the vertical part that descends down. And then lastly, the third part of the dodinum is horizontal. So this is when it goes across from the right psoas muscle to the left psoas muscle. It's four inches long, okay? And lastly, the last part is just one inch long and it just ends at the DJ flexure. Now, jejunum versus ileum, this is very important, very high yield stuff. The remainder of the small intestine is four to six meters long, okay? From the DJ flexure all the way down to the ileocecal junction, four to six meters long. So think about it, jejunum, for, first 40, 40% 40 jejunum, and second, 60% ileum. Remember, I just told you that the first inch of the first part of the dodenum was intraperitoneal, is intraperitoneal, since the rest of the parts are retroperitoneal. Now, the DJ flexure comes away from the left psoas muscle out of the screen in preparation to become intraperitoneal. Both jejunum and ileum are intraperitoneal, being suspended by the posterior abdominal wall by the mesentery called the mesentery, okay? There is no clear demarcation between jejunum and ileum, so how can you distinguish them? Well, allow me to um, clarify its um, characteristics. So as you see, Mandel, um, in comparison to ileum, the jejunum occupies the left upper quadrant, okay, is larger in diameter, has a thicker wall, and has higher and more numerous mucosal folds as it does more absorption, okay? And it also has less fat in the mesentery, making it basically the vessels more visible, and has fewer deeper vascular arcades and longer vessel recta. By the way, um, let's start off with the uh, pathway of the fruit. I think this is really important. Think about the pathway of the food. Let's start off with the dodinum, okay? The segmentation, what exactly is segmentation? So think of it as a tube, okay? Two ends, muscle contract, and the middle part, the muscles relax, okay? So the muscle, so the food just keeps going back and forth, back and forth, so you can give the good mixing of food with digestive enzymes and bile, and hence you get turbulent flow. With turbulent flow, okay, you're pushing the content against the absorptive epithelium, hence for better absorption. Now, 
so there are three types of movement in a cake, segmentation, peristalsis, so it's just coordinated contraction of the, the muscle to, al to allow food to propel in a unidirectional way. And lastly, retropulsion. Retropulsion basically means uh, it's a quite an important role for the upper duodenum actually, where it pushes pancreatic secretions and bile back up into the closed up pylorus, hence allowing for more mixing. But if you think about it, retropulsion is also important for vomiting, okay? In the jejunum, the presence of nutrients reduces peristaltic, uh, peristaltic contraction while increasing segmentation, okay? And this, in the jejunum, this is where you absorb most of your amino acids, sugar, and fatty acids, compared to the ileum, where mainly vitamin B12, and most of the bile acids are absorbed. Now, pathology of the uh, small intestine, celiac disease, very, very high yield. Please know this, might come up for your exams. So celiac disease is an autoimmune mediated intolerance like gliadin, which is a gluten protein found in wheat, resulting in malabsorption in the distal duodenum and or proximal jejunum. Patient could usually, patient would usually tell you, Oh, you know, I've been noticing that my stool has been a bit more difficult to flush. It's called steatoria. Now, celiac disease is associated with HLA-DQ2 and HLA-DQ8. Histologically, there are three features of celiac disease, okay? And these are, as you can see, villous atrophy, creep hyperplasia, and intraepithelial lymphocytosis. If you do a blood test, it usually reveals an IgA, TTG, known as the transglutaminase antibodies, and the anti-deaminated gliadin, gliadin peptide antibodies, IgG. The treatment is pretty straightforward, gluten-free diet. That means the individual has to abstain from wheat, rye, barley, or spelt. As you can see over here, image A, okay? Um, at the top, it's an early phase of the select disease characterized by tip-predominant intraepithelial lymphocytosis. You see heaps of lymphocytes, eh? Um, but that's all. Okay, as you look at B, image B, it's in a later phase of celiac disease is characterized by intraepithelial lymphocytosis, creep hyperplasia, and villous atrophy. You can see how much shorter it is. Eh? Now from the MD2s and above, remember that the celiac disease are commonly associated with a whole list of autoimmune disorders, such as type one diabetes, Addison's disease, also known as primary adrenal insufficiency, Hashimoto's uh, thyroiditis, and you know, inflammatory bowel disease. Large intestine. So the large intestine is one and a half meters long. Oh, getting excited at this part. <laughs> so the large intestine extends from the ileocecal junction to the rectum and the anal canal. Now the large intestine has three characteristic features. The first is that the large intestine is, has the presence of three discrete longitudinal muscle bands called tinea coli. Now in this small intestine, the muscularis propriates, it, it's literally a continuous layer of the inner circular muscle layer and an outer longitudinal muscle layer. Notably, the outer longitudinal muscle layer surrounds the entire tube in the small intestine. However, in the large intestine, the inner circular muscle is continuous here, but the outer longitudinal muscle splits into three discrete bands, okay, called tinea coli. The tinea coli is usually shorter than the muscular tube inside them, and they effectively just gather up, gather up the, muscular, uh, the mucosal tube, creating the appearance called seculations. Hence, the second characteristic feature of the large intestine is known as um, is the presence of saccules, also known as haustra. And the third characteristic feature of large intestine is the presence of fat tags, known as epiploic appendices. Now, the large intestine can be divided into individual parts, cecum, ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid colon, rectum, and anal canal. Now, the cecum is basically like a blight a blind ending pouch extending down below the ileocecal junction. On the posterior medial aspect of the cecum, the three tinea coli meet. Hanging off the point of the intersection between the three tinea coli on the cecum is a narrow tube. It's about three to four inches long called the appendix. An appendix is intraperitoneal. Now, the tip of the appendix is very variable, okay? In about 20% of cases, we see pelvic appendix. That means it crosses over the pelvic brim and the tip is just hanging down in the pelvis. But in about 65% of cases, the appendix is retro cecal, retro behind cecal, cecum, so behind the cecum, okay? So the ascending colon basically ascends up on the right-hand side of the ab abdominal wall from the cecum to a position just under the liver. And just as, is that, just as it passes the liver, turns 
And this is uh, this turn is called the hepatic flexure. After the descending colon, you get a transverse colon. Transverse colon just basically continues through all the way down, uh, all the way until it meets the uh, inferior portion of the spleen. And it turns down, it's called the splenic flexure. Now, um, if you do a colonoscopy, okay, this fun fact, when you do a colonoscopy and you're like, hey doc, where the hell, which part of the bowel am I at? Um, just know that the, um, if you see a Toblerone kind of shape during the transverse colon, okay? Now, you've got a descending colon, which just goes down the left um, lower quadrant. And then after that, it becomes the S-shaped uh, loop that hangs down the pelvic cavity. The sigmoid colon then comes up, straightens out at the midline and becomes the rectum and rect uh, canal. Now, the pathway of food for the colon is basically the small absorption um, of water from ileum to colon. So this results in the content of the bowel becoming very hyperviscous, okay? Now, pathology of large bowel, uh, large intestine. So firstly, there's inflammatory bowel disease, and you know there are two types, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Now, Crohn's disease can affect any part of your body from the mouth to the anus, but it usually affects the terminal ileum and colon, and is usually rectal sparing. Chronic, uh, Crohn's disease is characterized by transmural, that means it's just a complete inflammation throughout the walls, okay? Transmural inflammation, skip lesions, and you'll see cobblestone mucosa. Crohn's disease usually presents with um, chronic diarrhea, but may, which may or may not be bloody. Ulcerative colitis, on the other hand, causes continuous colonic lesions, according to the textbooks, and it always affects the rectum, okay? Ulcerative colitis, uh, uh, ulcerative colitis is characterized by mucosal and submucosal inflammation only. UC presents invariably with bloody diarrhea. If you think of bloody diarrhea, think of UC, okay, usually. So uh, interestingly, UC has a higher association of uh, risk factor, uh, which is uh, for col um, colorectal cancer. Now, um, I think some of your um, lecturers might have told you one improves with smoking and the other doesn't. Look, I think it's some consultants back to differ and others, you know, um, hold a very strong, uh, firm belief to that, but whatever. <laughs> so now let's talk about appendicitis. Appendicitis, acute inflammation of the appendix due to obstruction of fecal lift, which is a hard mass of fecal matter, or it could be an obstruction to normal stool or lymphoid hyperplasia. Appendicitis presents initially as a diffuse pain uh, at a peri-umbilical um, area, and then it extends all the way down, irritates your parietal peritoneum at the, um, uh, irritates your peri parietal peritoneum. And hence, once it irritates your parietal peritoneum, this is when pain becomes more localized, mainly at the McBurney point, okay? The McBurney point is just the one third distance between the right ASIS, okay, and your umbilicus. And this point roughly corresponds to the most common location of the base of the appendix where it is attached to the cecum. Appendix can be usually associated with nausea and vomiting. Now, from the MD2s and above, on physical examination, you'll be able to elicit the SOA sign, obturator sign, and Rolfsing signs. And you can detect guarding and rebound tenderness as well. And for treatment, it's pretty straightforward. Usually it's appendicectomy, okay? For the MD3s and MD4s, please note that there are many different presentations for appendicitis, and it usually depends on the location. For example, there's a classic medical student presentation, you know, it starts very vague pain at the umbilical area and then goes to the right elect fossa. Or there is the retrocecal appendicitis, there's pelvic appendicitis, and there's even perforated appendicitis. When it perforates, that's where all the gunk comes out and patient can be very, very, very sick, okay? So the next pathology to talk about in the large intestine is the diverticular disease. Now let's go through some terminology. Diverticulum. It's a blind pouch protruding from the GIT that communicates with the lumen of the GIT. Diverticulum can be classified as true diverticulum if it involves all the gut wall layers, or false diverticulum if it just involves the mucosa and submucosa. So remember, true if it affects all the layers, false if it affects just the mucosa and submucosa. Now, diverticulitis, diverticulosis, sorry, it's used when there are many false diverticula in the colon. And most commonly, it's in the sigmoid colon. Diverticulosis is actually usually caused by increased intra-abdominal pressure and focal weakness of your uh, colonic wall. It's usually due to you know, people having low diet fiber, obesity, and high in total like fat or like red meat content. So basically, a patient who constantly strain, who have poor bowel movement or severely constipated, you can imagine how much stress it places on the wall of the colon. 
So now diverticulosis is usually asymptomatic and is associated with just some vague abdominal pain. Complications can include you know, painless rectal bleeding and diverticulitis. Now, diverticulitis is the inflammation of the diverticula, okay, with wall thick thickening. It can present as a sharp left lower quadrant pain, fever, and leukocytosis. Just know that, um, interestingly, from MD2s especially, uh, diverticulitis for normal Caucasians will be more, um, the common sites on the left, and in Asians, more on the right side. Now, the liver. This is one of my favorite organs. It's a solid viscera, and it's situated on the right upper quadrant. The liver has two surfaces, okay? Entero superior and postero inferior. And it's separated by a sharp inferior margin. Entero superior surface of the liver relates to the diaphragm and is called the diaphragmatic surface. The diaphragmatic surface is smooth and dome-shaped. Dome the postero surface of the liver, however, relates to the visceral, hence it's called the visceral surface. Now, the visceral surface bears the impression of the adjacent structures. Diaphragmatic surface is divided into two unequal lobes, a big right lobe and a sm small left lobe, and this is separated by the falciform ligament. The falciform ligament is a peritoneal reflection. Now, remember the liver is intraperitoneal because it's wrapped up by all the um, ligaments that, meant, that I've talked to you about earlier, the hepatogastric ligament and the dodinal um, gastric ligament, uh, he uh, hepatic dodinal ligament. But really knew this, so now, um, let's just move on to the ligament in teres. Running in the free inferior edge of the falcimal ligament, okay, you see that white part, just the free edge below, okay, it's called the ligament in teres. It's also called the round ligament, the round ligament of the liver. Ligament in teres is the obliterated umbilical vein. At the top of the liver, the double fold of peritoneum forms the falciform ligament and splits and attaches to the undersurface of the right hemidiaphragm called the coronary ligament. Now, visceral surface is a lot busier. On a visceral surface, you cannot see the falciform ligament. Instead, you can see a H-shaped fascia. And this fascia is pretty important. The cross-shaped H bears the hilum of the liver called the porter hepatis. Porter hepatis consists of three structures, okay, known as a portal triad. Firstly, hepatic artery to the left, portal vein behind, and common hepatic duct to the right. Portal vein collects up the venous drainage from the GIT and delivers to the liver. Hence, the two vascular inputs at the portal hepatis, one is the hepatic um, artery and the other is the portal vein. Now, the H-shaped fascia creates two extra lobes, actually. There's the caudate lobe on top and the quadrate lobe below. So remember, bigger right lobe, smaller left lobe, caudate lobe on the top, quadrate lobe below. All right, so let's move on to uh, the pathologies. Okay, the first one, we've got the alcoholic liver disease. So alcoholic liver disease exists on the spectrum that begins with the hepatic steatosis, which progresses to alcoholic hepatitis, which finally progresses to alcoholic cirrhosis. When you see this on the exams, okay, AST to ALT ratio, two is to one, highly suggestive, highly of alcoholic liver disease, okay? So now, let me talk a bit more about like the changes. So in hepatic, steato, uh, hepatic steatosis or alcohol-induced fatty liver, it simply describes you know, accumulation of fat in the liver. There is no inflammation yet, okay? Um, at this stage, hepatic steatosis, it's usually reversible after alcohol cessation. So stop drinking alcohol. Now, if the patient continues to drink alcohol, hepatic steatosis now progresses to alcoholic hepatitis, okay? In its name, titus, inflammation of the liver. So in alcoholic hepatitis, you get a swollen, uh, you get, it's swollen and necrotic hepatocytes. And this is, okay, note this word, described as ballooning degeneration on histology, okay? And neutrophilic infiltration, as well as uh, formation of mallory bodies. So let me repeat myself. You get swollen and necrotic hepatocytes, known as ballooning degeneration, neutrophilic infiltration, okay? As well as the formation of mallory bodies. Now, the triad of steatosis, inflammation, and ballooning is known as steatohepatitis, identified on histology. Lastly, the last stage you get is alcoholic cirrhosis. Alcohol, uh, alcoholic cirrhosis is the final and usually irreversible process, uh, form. In alcoholic cirrhosis, you get regenerative nodules surrounded by fibrous bands in response to chronic liver injury, resulting in portal hypertension and end-stage liver disease. In, now, let's talk about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. To be honest, 
non-alcoholic fat, fatty liver disease, it's just like NASH. Uh, it's just like alcoholic liver disease, except the patient doesn't really drink alcohol. <laughs> so it's mainly caused by metabolic syndrome. Obesity results in fatty infiltrations of the hepatocytes, resulting in cellular ballooning and eventual necrosis. Now, non-alcoholic liver fatty disease may progress to non-alcoholic steatohepatitis called NASH, which can then progress to cirrhosis, and then finally, hepatocellular carcinoma, okay? Now, hepatocellular carcinoma, this is one of my favorite topics. Um, it's the most common primary malignant tumor of the liver in adults. So hepatitis C, chronic hepatitis C is the commonest cause of liver cirrhosis. So it, as of 2020, okay, the causes of hep, um, hepatocellular carcinoma, commonest cause is hep C, followed by alcohol-related liver disease, followed by hep B, and then fatty liver disease. If the patient is infected by hepatitis B, it can get, okay, the reason why hep B is actually pretty scary is because hep B, in patients with hep B, you can get hepatocellular carcinoma in the absence of cirrhosis. And you'd be thinking like, Sean, what the hell? That doesn't even make sense. It actually does because hepatitis B virus is itself an oncogenic virus in it, okay? So for the MD2s and above, please note that the laboratory test for the hepatocellular carcinoma will show raised alpha fetoprotein. Hepatocellular carcinoma surveillance should be about four to eight months, but uh, as of 2021, uh, Medical Journal Australia has shown ideally it should be done every six months. As if you do it every six months, it showed good um, cost effectiveness and improved survival. For optimal diagnosis of hepatocellular carcinoma, you'd like to do a multi-phase CT scan with pre-contrast and three, um, three post-contrast phases, late hepatic arterial, portal venous, and delayed. Uh, MD1s and the rest, don't worry, this is extra information. You can also use MRI to detect um, whether one has possibly hepatocellular carcinoma. Now, for patients with chronic liver disease, it's best to perform an ultrasound to have a nice view of the liver form, the structures, um, and the biliary tree visibility, as well as to see uh, whether there's any atrophy. If you've got chronic liver disease, it's good to use this thing called the fibro scan. It's a type of um, ultrasound as well, particularly good with patients infected with hepatitis C. Remember, Hep B, you can get HCC without causing cirrhosis. The Hep C usually causes cirrhosis, followed by your hepatocellular carcinoma. If you don't use FibroScan, you can use Acoustic Radiation Force Imaging, ARFI. And it's better than FibroScan, actually, because it processes a larger surface of the liver at once by using a higher frequency. Now, for all the MD2s, please note this. Prognosis of um, chronic liver disease, okay, via child pew score. And if a patient um, is, if you want to assess whether a patient is um, a candidate for liver transplant, you do the MELT score, modified end stage liver disease score for assessing severity in liver transplant patients. Usually it requires a score less than 20, okay? Now, I know there's a lot to take in guys, but bear with me. This slide shows an image of the biliary tract, okay? So the bowel is produced from, okay, let's go through step by step. Bowel is produced by hepatocytes secreted into the bowel caniliculi, which is then drained into the intrahepatic bowel ductils, also known as the canal of herring, which is then drained into the interlobular bowel ducts, and then finally to the right and left common hepatic duct before merging together to form the common hepatic duct. Let me repeat again, bowel produced by hepatocytes, okay? Bowel from hepatocytes goes, gets secreted into the bowel caniliculi, and then it gets drained into the intra hepatic bowel ductils, then into the interlobular bowel ductils, and then finally left and right hepatic ducts before merging together to form the common hepatic duct, okay? After a short course about four centimeters, the common hepatic duct is joined by the cystic duct to form the common bile duct. The common bile duct travels from the porter hepatis, as I mentioned just now, towards the second part of the duodenum in the free inferior edge of the lesser omentum and passes behind the first part of the duodenum. It is then joined by the pancreatic duct to form the ampulla of vata and empties its content into the major duodenal papilla, okay? In a fasting state, interesting, in a fasting state, the sphincter of Audi is closed, okay? It's, it snaps shut. So the bowel produced from the liver goes all the way down, blah, 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 right, left, hepatic duct, common bowel duct, all the way down, and it goes, and as it reaches the closed sphincter of the bowel, uh, the Audi, closed sphincter of the Audi, uh, bowel backs up and then it's stored in the um, gallbladder. Okay. Now, 
the entry of fatty acids and or certain amino acids into the duodenum stimulates enteroendocrine cells called I cells, if you remember by now, I cells to release a hormone called cholecystokinin. Now, cholecystokinin has a couple of, um, uh, acts on a couple of organs. So first, it acts on acinar cells of the pancreas to stimulate release of pancreatic enzymes for so digestion. And also, CCK acts on the gallbladder to contract. When it contracts, it releases its stored bile. Okay. As a result, bowel and pancreatic enzymes are delivered through the major duodenal papilla into the second part of the duodenum. Now, the gallbladder is a pear-shaped tubular viscous. It's divided into parts. The rounded part is called the fundus. Okay. I know in the stomach, the fundus is a superior part, but in this gallbladder, it's the inferior part. Okay. It's like a little sac. The fundus projects beyond the sharp inferior margin of the liver. All right. Fundus narrows to a body. And the body of the gallbladder is what lies in contact with the visceral surface of the liver. The body is directed upwards and backwards and becomes the neck. And finally, the neck is continuous with the cystic duct. Now, let's talk about common pathologies. So the first is cholelithiasis. It's just a fancy name for stones in the gallbladder, okay? And factors that contribute to gallstone formation inc includes increased cholesterol, inc increased bilirubin, and decrease bile salts and gallbladder stasis. So who gets uh, the gallstones? Usually think of um, the four Fs, fat, fertile, uh, which is multi-parity, 40, female, okay? And fair. Cholelithiasis commonly presents with a pattern of pain called biliary colic. After a fatty meal, eye cells, as I mentioned just now, secrete CCK, which causes the CCK to contract. Now, when the gallbladder contracts, uh, uh, contraction forces a stone into the cystic duct, this causes pain. Biliary colic is usually associated with a normal LFT, so don't worry too much. Cholelithiasis is commonly diagnosed with ultrasound and can be treated with elective cholecystectomy. Cholecystectomy, removal of the gallbladder, if symptomatic. Now, secondly, cholecystitis. A complication of cholelithiasis is cholecystitis, and it's just a fancy name for inflammation of the gallbladder. Patients with cholecystitis presents with Murphy sign, which is a term used for when you, when you get a patient to inspire, okay, and you put your hand over there and it hurts. The third would be cholelithiasis. It's a fancy name for just stones in a common bile duct. And lastly, ascending cholangitis. One complication of cholelithiasis is ascending cholangitis. And it's just a fancy term for infection of the biliary tree due to obstruction that leads to stasis and bacterial overgrowth. Patients with ascending cholangitis presents with this thing called the Charcot's triad. So remember, fever, jaundice, and right upper quadrant pain, okay? And if it's very severe, patients with ascending cholangitis can present with Reynolds pentad, which includes fever, jaundice, right upper, right upper quadrant pain, hypotension, and altered mental state. For emergency med uh, management for the MD2s, do your classic doctors A, B, C, D, E, okay? Um, the current antibiotic choice on ETG is gentamicin, uh, amoxicillin, or ampicillin um, plus metronidazole. Okay, and uh, if gentamicin is contraindicated, just give a uh, pip test. Now, by the way, do you know how gallstones are formed specifically? So, let me tell you: gallstones form when the bile, okay, so that that is stored in the gallbladder hardens into pieces of solid material. This pr process requires three conditions. The first is that the bowel must supersaturate itself with cholesterol. This may occur when there's excess cholesterol with normal quantities of bowel salts or normal levels of cholesterol with decreased quantities of bowel salts. The second condition is accelerated cholesterol crystal nucleation or the rapid transition from liquid to crystal. This occurs when there's excess nucleation factors or absence of nucleation inhibitors. The third condition is for gallstone formation is gallbladder hypomotility, a condition in which the crystals, uh, it causes basically the crystals to remain in the gallbladder for a longer point in time. Now, the pancreas. The pancreas is a comma-shaped solid viscous. The head of the pancreas is C-shaped, okay? And the head of the pancreas is a wedge-shaped process, and it comes off the uncinate process. The superior mesenteric vessels crosses over the left renal vein, emerge between the neck of the pancreas above and the uncinate process of the pancreas below, and then crosses over the horizontal part of the duodenum. The neck of the pancreas lies deep to the pyloric canal, 
and the body of the pancreas extends from the right to the left of, above the DJ fracture. The body narrows to your tail, and the tail of the pancreas is basically heads towards the spleen of the hilum, uh, the hilum of the spleen. Pancreas is retroperitoneal, which is obvious due to its relationship to the duodenum. Now, pancreas is both an exocrine and an endocrine organ. Exocrine, basically you've got your ductal cells, okay, of the pancreas that produces bicarbonate. And bicarbonate, as you know by now, neutralizes the acidic chyme from the stomach. Acinna cells of the pancreas produces pancreatic enzymes which break down proteins, triglycerides, and carbohydrates. Bicarbonate and this pancreatic enzymes enter uh, the pancreatic duct and are released into the second part of the duodenum through the major duodenal papilla. Now, the endocrine part of um, pancreas, you've got your islet cells, okay? So let's talk about the alpha cells first. The alpha cells in the islet of Lang uh, Langerhan produces glucagon. Glucagon just basically increases glycolysis, gluconeogenesis, okay, to produce more uh, um, sugar, lipid metabolism so that lipolysis and ketogenesis can occur. And this is commonly seen in like uh, poorly controlled diabetes, especially in type 1 diabetes, DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis. You can also find trace amounts in, um, of ketones in a hyperosmolar hy um, hyperglycemic state, which is a type of um, complication in diabetes where one experiences a super high uh, blood sugar levels of more than 30 millibols per liter. For DKA, it's more than 14. For HHS, it's more than 30, okay? Now, let's talk about the beta cells. Beta cells, 75, it makes up 75% of the islet of Langerhans. So now, the beta islet cells just produces insulin. Delta cells in the islet Langerhans produces somatostatin. And this products um, are released directly into the bloodstream, okay? So this is just a, um, as you can see, somatostatin just works on a wide variety of uh, organs, okay? Now, pathology of the pancreas. Pancreatitis, I get smashed. So what's I get smashed? Idiopathic, gallstones, ethanol, trauma, steroids, mumps, autoimmune disease, scorpion stings, hyperglycemia, hydroglyceridemia, uh, ERCP, and certain drugs such as, such as azathioprine. Amongst these, basically, as you can see in this photo, so amongst these, uh, the most common cause is actually alcohol and gallstones. Now, the diagnosis is made based on the presence of two or three criteria. Acute epigastric pain, often radiating to the back. Okay, keep that in mind. Increased serum lipase, usually about three times the upper limit of normal or characteristic imaging findings. For the MD2s and above, use Ranson's criteria for pancreatitis mortality based on initial, and, uh, initial values uh, and 48 hours. The other classifications you can use is revised Atlanta classification or Glasgow IMRI score for acute pancreatitis. Now, in terms of uh, management for pancreatitis, if it's mild, give, just give analgesia because patients in pain. So you give analgesia and you also want to feed it anteriorly because when you feed the patient anteriorly, that means straight through the stomach, not through the mouth, give him a tube, feed him through there. Um, this reduces the risk of bacterial translocation, okay? However, if you suspect that the pancreatitis is caused by a gallstone, do an ERCP, okay? So ERCP basically helps to remove the stone. But ERCP, <laughs> I know it's a bit weird, can also cause pancreatitis. Now, in chronic hepatitis, it can result in pancreatic insufficiency, okay? But in chronic pancreatitis, it usually takes about 10 years to develop. For exocrine insufficiency, okay, exocrine, you get steatorial or malabsorption, okay? So uh, remember exocrine insufficiency is basically just to absorb your food, yeah? So in management, if you can't produce any of this good stuff, engage a dietitian and give enzyme replacement therapy known as Creon, C-R-E-O-N. For the in endocrine side, uh, this is a new term for many of you. Uh, when the pancreas fails to produce enough uh, insulin, in this case, in this like chronic um, pancreatitis state, it's called type 3C diabetes mellitus. So how do you treat this patient? Refer to endocrinologist and usually just give them insulin. Now, pancreatic cancer. This is very scary. Pancreatic, pancreatic cancer adenoma, uh, adenocarcinoma is a very aggressive tumor arising from the pancreatic ducts. Now, pancreatic adenocarcinoma is often metastatic at presentation with an average survival rate of one year after diagnosis, just one year. 
Pancreatic adenocarcinoma occurs most often at the head of the pancreas and can often cause obstructive jaundice, okay? So pancreatic adenocarcinoma is associated with CA99, which is a tumor marker. And it often presents with, same thing, abdominal pain radiating to the back, weight loss due to malabsorption and anorexia, and this thing called migratory thrombophlebitis. Um, if you know, it's called Trezio's, uh, Trezio's syndrome. You don't really need to know that, but I'll just show you. Okay, so in this photo, can you see that huge, can you see that PD? Yeah, so usually you're not supposed to see like a dilated PD, okay? And you can see that mass. It's very fuzzy, very irregular. This is Trezio syndrome, uh, okay? Can you see? So it's basically redness and tenderness and palpations on extremities. And you get your covusus sign. Covusus sign is basically, can you see that gray little pear-shaped thing? That's a gallbladder and it's so damn big. So the main treatment for, um, okay, sorry. So pancreatic cancer can cause obstructive jaundice. That's why you get a huge bladder, okay? Because things bow and all backs up. So the main treatment for pancreatic cancer is Ripple's procedure. And what is Ripple's procedure? It's called pancreatic co duodenal nectomy. Remove, remove part of the duodenum remove part of the pancreas, along with chemotherapy and radiation therapy. There you go. So now, brace yourself for the arterial supply of the GIT. <laughs> um, let's just take a 15 second break now, go and stretch, and then I'll try to simplify for you the arterial supply of the GIT, okay? 15 seconds. <laughs> All right, this is my favorite part. I promise I'll make this easy for you guys. <sighs> okay, let's go. C-leg trunk. Now, before I delve into detail, imagine you are the C-leg trunk and you're a clock, okay? So the C-leg trunk basically um, starts off immediately after it traverses the diaphragmatic orifice, okay? So it basically starts between the 12th thoracic and the first lumbar vertebrae, okay? And, oops, sorry. Uh, yep, so the C-leg trunk trifurcates, okay? It splits into three different branches. Left gastric artery, splenic artery, and common hepatic artery. Now, don't feel stressed out. I'm going to make this really, really straightforward for you. Now, first, one o'clock, you shoot out the left gastric artery to supply the lesser curvature. And then you remember, oh, I forgot, I'm pretty near the esophagus. So you send out some esophageal branches to supply it. So first branch would be left gastric artery but it shoots up some esophageal branches, okay? Done, first branch, done. Second branch, splenic artery. Now the splenic artery takes a tortuous course, okay? It's very tortuous if you actually engage in a uh, dissection. Uh, you actually see it on a cadaver. It's, the splenic artery is tortuous and it approaches the, the hilum of the spleen, okay? But just as it approaches the hilum of the spleen, okay? It shoots out some pancreatic uh, branches because it's like, you know, hey, I'm going over the pancreas, why not just feel free to uh, give it some uh, blood supply? So splenic artery shoots out some pancreatic branches to supply the pancreas while approaching the hilum of the spleen. Just as it's about to reach the hilum of the spleen, uh, yeah, it splits into two branches. Top, so it shoots off the short gastric artery to supply the fundus, as well as the left gastroepiploic artery to supply the lesser curvature, okay? Now, uh, so fun fact, the word epiploic derives from the a uh, Greek word called epiplene, which means to flow or just to sail along, okay? And the last branch is the common hepatic artery. Now, stay with me, this is a bit more tricky. So the common hepatic artery splits into proper hepatic artery and gastrododinal artery, okay? So the proper hepatic artery, as the name suggests, goes to the liver. But before it goes to the liver, you're like, oh shit, let me just send out a right gastric artery. So the right gastric artery runs along the um, lesser curvature to anastomose with the left gastric artery, okay? Now, the proper hepatic artery now approaches the um, liver through the inferior edge of the free border of the hepatododinal ligament. As it approaches the liver, it sends out left and right hepatic artery along with the cystic artery because this gallbladder is just at the liver. It just makes things much more convenient, okay? So now we've got a hepatic uh, proper hepatic artery out of the picture. Now you're left with the gastrododinal artery. Now the gastrododinal artery shoots out a right gastroepiploic artery to anastomose with the left gastroepiploic artery. And then it should be ends off being the superior pancreatic duodenal artery to supply the 
um, superior part of the uh, duodenum as well as the pancreas. Now let's, let's just go through everything again. Celiac trunk shoots out left gastric artery, okay? But esophagus is nearby, so esophageal branches, done. Second, splenic artery, tortuous course all the way to the hilum of the spleen. But just as it goes across the pancreas, it shoots out some um, pancreatic branches, okay? This is a very important, it might come up in your exam questions. What are the blood supply for pancreas, okay? So splenic artery, tortuous course, towards the hilum of the spleen. But just as it does that, it shoots out pancreatic branches. As it approaches the hilum of the spleen, it splits, uh, it, it branches, there are two more branches, the top short gastric artery to supply the fundus and your left gastroepiploic artery to run along the greater curvature, okay? Then two branches done of the celiac trunk. Last branch, common hepatic artery. Common hepatic artery splits into proper hepatic artery and your gastrodotinal artery, okay? Proper hepatic artery, remember I just said, on the way to the liver, you're like, oh shit, I forgot to supply the liver. It shoots out a right gastric artery, runs along the lesser curvature to anastomose at the first branch of the celiac artery, done, uh, of the left gastric um, artery, done. And then it approaches the um, liver, splits into left and right, and cystic artery. Your gastrododinal artery now shoots out a right gastroepiploic artery, runs along the greater curvature to anastomose at the left gastroepiploic artery, which is from the splenic artery. Before the get, and finally, it, it, ends up being the superior pancreatic duodenal artery, okay? Now, let's move on. So as you can see, this picture, I think it shows a very nice illustration of um, the uh, position. Okay, so you get your hepatic artery, your portal vein, and in front of it is your common bowel duct. So the most medial uh, structure would be your hepatic artery, okay? But this also includes like lymphatics and nerves, but don't, really, don't worry about that. Now, celiac artery, done. That's the most difficult part. Now let's talk about the superior mesenteric artery. Superior mesenteric artery now comes off at the level of L1, okay? And it appears just right beneath the border of the pancreas and hits over the top of the third part of the duodenum, which is the horizontal part. It then runs along the mesentery, okay? Passing structures from the DJ flexure all the way to the third part of the duodenum, across the abdominal aorta, across the IVC, across the right psoas muscle and finally to the right elect fossa. Kind of like you're wearing a slash, okay? So as mentioned, the superior mesenteric artery supplies major duodenal papilla all the way to the two thirds of the transverse colon. So what are these branches? The first branch is the inferior pancreatic duodenal artery. It makes perfect sense. If there's a superior pancreatic duodenal artery, there must be an inferior, yeah? So basically the inferior pancreatic duodenal artery supplies the rest of the pancreas and duodenum. So the main supply for pancreas now, okay, if this comes up in exam, is your splenic artery, superior and inferior pancreatic duodenal artery. Okay, done. First branch of the SMA done. Now it runs through the V mesentery and shoots out jejunal and ileal branches to supply the jejunum and the ileum, okay, as his name suggests. Now, as it approaches the colon, it splits into three colic branches. The first, ileocolic artery, iliocolic artery. As its name suggests, iliocolic, it supplies the terminal part of the ileum, cecum, appendix, and the ascending colon. Now, the second branch is the right colic artery. It just basically innovate, um, supplies the ascending colon and the middle colic artery that supplies the proximal two-thirds of the transverse colon. It's important to note that all these colic arteries feed into this thing called the marginal artery, okay? It's also known as the marginal artery of um, Drummond. Lastly, you're almost there. So finally, inferior mesenteric artery comes off at L3, just below the duodenum, and it supplies the distal part of the transverse colon all the way down to the anal canal. Now, there are, there are only two branches. Firstly, left colic artery, which supplies the distal one-third of the transverse colon, as well as the descending colon. And the other branch is the sigmoid colon, which uh, supplies the sigmoid, um, the sigmoid artery, which supplies the sigmoid colon. Now let's revise the entire, uh, entire um, arterial supply, GRT, one last time, okay? Celiac trunk passes, uh, comes up the moment it passes through the diaphragmatic orifice. Left gastric artery, esophageal branches, done. Splenic artery, tortuous course, sends out pancreatic branches to supply the pancreas. As it approaches the hilum of the spleen, splits into short gastric artery and left gastroepiploic artery that runs along the greater curvature. Done. Right side, common hepatic artery, splits into proper hepatic artery, 
and gastrodinal artery. Proper hepatic artery is like, shit, I need to supply the stomach and shoots out the right gastric artery. Runs along the last curvature and anastomosis with the left gastric artery. Now, once it's done, that hits towards the um, hilum of the liver, splits into left, right, and cystic artery. Now, you've got your gastrodinal artery, which shoots out the right gastroepiploic artery, runs along the greater curvature to anastomose with the left gastroepiploic artery. And then lastly, it ends off being the superior pancreatical dodinal artery. Okay, done. Celiac trunk of the picture. Now, su superior mesenteric artery. First shoots up an inferior pancreatical dodinal artery to fully supply the remaining parts of the dodinum and the pancreas. And then sends out jejunal ileal branches and followed by colic branches. Okay, your iliocolic branch, your right colic branch, and your middle colic branch, which supplies the proximal two thirds of your colon. And lastly, your inferior mesenteric artery, L3. L3 supplies distal part of uh, transverse colon through the left colic artery, as well as the descending colon. Sigmoid artery, which supplies the sigmoid colon as well. And it ends up being the superior rectal artery, okay? This supplies the rectum and canal, inner canal. Now, just persevere, we're almost there, okay? Almost there. You can do it. It's a lot of content, but I shall pass my time now to Reese. Cool, I'll share my screen. Um, here we go. All right, so uh, for my section, it's pretty much the physiology of fat, which uh, it's the, for the gut physiology, it's digestion and absorption. Uh, as Sean said, stomach has rugae, which are these folds that allow the stomach to expand when food gets in there. And then uh, stomach has gastric pits, and each gastric pit has about three to five gastric glands. So within these glands are the types of cells needed for the stomach to function. And there are five different cell types you should essentially remember. Um, the important ones are the parietal cells, which produce stomach acid. There's the stem cells, which renew uh, the cells of the stomach due to turnover. There is the mucus cells, which produce mucin. Uh, that's part of the mucus protecting the stomach. There's a the chief cells that produce pepsinogen, which is uh, the enzyme that gets activated when it comes in contact with the stomach acid becoming pepsin and that digests the uh, protein in food. And then there's the endocrine cells, which sort of send signals to parietal cells promoting it to produce um, stomach acid. So the way stomach acid is produced, this is like sort of an important concept for um, ND1 is um, it happens through water and uh, carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide just simply diffuses through the membrane, goes inside the parietal cells and um, with water, with the uh, assistance of carbonic and hydrase produces HCO3 and H plus. So the H plus goes through the proton pump through to the lumen of the stomach. So it just swaps with K. And the HCO3 goes back into the bloodstream through a bicarbonate chloride exchanger. So this excess of HCO3 in the blood creates alkaline tide, making the blood uh, like more alkaline. And this is like I guess part partly responsible for making you a bit sleepy when you have a big meal. Um, and this is combated through uh, the pancreas. So the way we produce H plus ions in the stomach in, to the lumen of stomach in this process, the reverse of this happens in the pancreas, may, producing more alkaline uh, enzymes. So the blood near the pancreas will be more acidic. So combining with this, it will become neutralized again. So here through this mechanism, we have H plus through the proton pump in the stomach lumen. Once uh, HCO3 goes back out, it's exchanged with chloride. Chloride comes in and through chloride leak channels, it goes into the lumen of the stomach. So together these two make HCL and that's your stomach acid. But obviously there's other um, mechanisms involved promoting this, which all these intraendocrine cells come in. Uh, in this step, so the cephalic phase, when you smell, taste the food and you start chewing it, that's when the parasympathetics kick in and the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve produces acetylcholine that uh, attaches to the muscarinic receptors on ECL cells. This promotes pr production of histamine and histamine binds to parietal cells, promoting it to produce HCL. That's the first, uh, I guess, promoter. 
Hey, acetylcholine binds to parietal cells itself as well, and that promotes it to further produce HCL. And then the other way the parasympathetics can do this is HCH. There should be another arrow here, ideally. So HCH binds to the G cells and promotes G cells to produce gastrin, and gastrin then binds to parietal cells, promoting it to produce more HCL. So there's three different mechanisms, through histamine, directly through acetylcholine, and through gastrin. And this can be combated and or slowed down by these two mechanisms. You have your D cells that produce somatostatin, and this, pro uh, this process is initiated when the pH of uh, the stomach falls below a certain level. So when it becomes too acidic, this process kicks in. Somatostatin is produced, and that stops G cells from pr producing gastrin, and that reduces dance downstream production of HCL. Somatostatin also inhibits the ECL cells from producing histamine. So it has this double whammy action, reducing HCL. And then we have prostaglandin as well that has two functions. One of them is to push parietal cells to reduce production of HCL. And then they promote production of mucin from the mucus cells that forms the protective layer of the stomach from the stomach acid. So this is where your pathology, I guess, comes in. The use of NSAIDs, which is a COX inhibitor, they, they stop production of uh, PGE2 and PGI2. And if you have reduced PGE2 and PGI2, you would have less mucus, so less, less protective barrier in the stomach, and then you would have more acid because this inhibitory pathway is sort of slowed down or stopped. You'll have more acid, less protection, and then you'll get gastritis and stomach ulcers. Uh, the way uh, I guess the drugs work here is uh, you have the, I'll go back a slide. So the proton pump inhibitors, uh, so the proton pump inhibitors, the PPIs, they work here. So this is the proton pump. They stop the H going in, so they reduce the stomach acid. And then ranitidine, which is Zantac, it works here. That stops um, the works here stops histamine binding from to the H2 receptors. So this, if ranitidine works here, it stops histamine binding to H2 receptor. It will reduce promotion of producing HCL. And if uh, PPIs work here, they would stop H plus going into the stomach lumen. So that way you can, I guess, reduce rate of gastritis or rate of production of HCL. Um, the next section we can go through is, I guess, digestion. We'll move on to uh, carbohydrate digestion and absorption first. We can't digest uh, polysaccharides, so we can only di uh, we can't absorb polysaccharides. We can we can only digest them to mono, so we can only absorb mono. And the way this works is. Um, you have these large, um, you have these large carbohydrate molecules and amylases, the enzyme, the pancreatic enzyme that sort of digests it to disaccharides, and then you have these other enzymes that further digest the disaccharides to monosaccharides, which is glucose, fructose, fructose, and ga galactose. And only these monosaccharides can be absorbed through the intestines. And there's two different ways it can be done. So glucose and galactose go through the sodium uh, SGLT uh, channels, so uh, sodium glucose transporters. So you get one glucose, one galactose, and one sodium going in. And then fructose goes through GLUT5. And once they're inside the enterocytes, they both exit on GLUT2. So, so Glucose and galactose goes through with sodium. Fructose goes on GLUT5. Together, they exit through GLUT2. That's how you absorb it into the blood. And then the next one is protein. <clears throat> the first step happens, I guess, in the stomach where pepsinogen is converted to pepsin and it breaks down the protein. Inside the small intestine, you have these other peptidases. There's two different types. There's endopeptidases, which sort of attack the proteins inside the structure. So it's called endo inside the structure and exopeptidases, which can't get inside the structure. So they sort of cut down the proteins on, on each end, making it slowly smaller. So uh, an important endopeptidase is trypsin. It's, um, yeah, so it cuts down uh, larger molecules into smaller molecules and exopeptidases, aminopeptidase and carboxypeptidase. <clears throat> it attacks either end of the proteins and cuts them down into small molecules. 
And once you get small molecules into uh, dipeptides, tripeptides, or amino acids, so there's different ways to, um, I guess, absorb these. One of the ways you can absorb this is uh, dipeptides and tripeptides, <clears throat> they co-transport with um, hydrogen inside the enterocytes and the amino acids co-transport with sodium. And if you have small peptides, they sort of go in by transcytosis. <clears throat> they get engulfed, they go inside the enterocytes. And through a similar process, they get out through the other side to the portal vein and then through to the liver. And finally, we have the lipid digestion. This one's a bit trickier because there's several steps involved. Obviously, lipids are, like, as is common throughout the whole GI system, we can't absorb large molecules, so we have to break them down. But because lipids are, like, um, hydrophilic, you, see, you sort of need to equate an emulsion. That's where the bile salts come in that come in from the gallbladder. And the bile salts have this hydrophilic end and hydrophobic end. The hydrophobic end attached to the lipids and the hydrophilic end attached to the enzyme. So it creates this emulsion and then uh, the pancreatic enzyme lipase sort of breaks down these um, lipids into smaller fatty acids. Since lipase can't access every bit of this emulsion, there's co-lipase that sort of moves this uh, bile salts away from the fat molecules, and then lipase gets further access to it and then breaks it down further into these micelles. The fatty acids, are, the monoglycerides and fatty acids move out of micelles and enter the cell by diffusion because you have this membrane that facilitates diffusion. Cholesterol is co-transported into the cell by the... Uh, cholesterol sort of transporter and one drug that uh, targets this is the isinimib which reduces absorption of cholesterol in the gut so once all the cholesterol and monoglycerides and fatty acids are absorbed into the enterocytes they go into the smooth er they form colimicrons and then they exit out to the other side they can't be absorbed into capillaries because they're too large so they get absorbed into the lymph and lymph transports it further up into the body and then just dumps it into the vena cava. I guess this is the sort of the um, anatomical and physiological fault the body has because it goes through the vena cava and then just like the whole body absorbs all your fat and just dumps it right into the heart. That might, uh, I guess, um, contribute to atherosclerosis because everything is absorbed and goes directly to the liver, but this goes right through to the vena cava, superior vena cava. Right. Um, then we have a couple of cases for you guys. I'll ask Sean to take the first one. I'll take the other one. Easy. All right. So now, yeah. uh, would you like to stop sharing? Okay. Okay. So this is where we... Oops, sorry. Okay. Let's... Um, there we go. Okay. Done. Okay, so first case scenario, 32 year old woman presents to ED with abdominal pain. I know all of you are being fed with heaps of information, so I, I shan't bore you with the details, okay? But now, let's think of a couple of uh, differentials. So um, let's focus on quadrants. If it's the right upper quadrant, you'd be thinking about maybe gallstones, acute cholecystitis, inflammation of the uh, gallbladder, ascending cholangitis, hepatitis, chronic liver disease as well. Um, and for your epigastric pain, which is right here in the middle, you'd be thinking about um, acute myocardial infarction, pancreatitis, acute gastritis, peptic ulcer disease, or gastroesophageal reflux disease. I'll just show you the differentials now so we can all take a look. So if it's usually one side, like the lower abdominal pain syndromes, as you can see, it's appendicitis on the right lower quadrant, or diverticulitis on the um, left lower quadrant. But remember, I just said in Caucasians, many on the left, in, um, and Asians, there's a high number, of, high proportion of them with that presents diverticulitis on the right lower quadrant, okay? Oh, and I want to share with you a fun fact. Um, do you know that the liver itself doesn't really, con we don't experience pain from the liver itself. It's actually the capsule that contains pain fibers. So when the liver stretches here, yeah, it, it, it causes, um, I think, I, I believe so, like uh, increased sensitization, uh, sensitization and firing of this uh, pain receptors. Please don't ask me whether it's uh, A delta or C fibers. I don't know. But yeah, so when it stretches on the capsule, this is when patients experience pain. 
may be thinking, only stretch? No, that's not true. Patients with hepatitis, when there is inflammation, they kind of irritate the, uh, the membrane around it, the capsule, and they get pain as well. So yeah, now you know it, fun fact. So, okay, let's focus on the abdominal pain. Right upper quadrant, gallstones, acute cholecystitis, ascending cholangitis, hepatitis, chronic liver disease. If it's epigastric pain, you can get uh, acute myocardial infarction, can, you can present as a low um, epigastric pain, pancreatitis, acute gastritis, peptic ulcer disease, and gastroesophageal reflux disease. No, there are many other causes as well to all this kind of pain, okay? You can think of the respiratory system, such as a lower lobe pneumonia. Yeah, lower lobe pneumonia can present as a left or right upper quadrant pain, or even a epigastric pain, okay? Now, for the lower abdominal pain syndromes, <laughs> if it's one side, you usually think about diverticulitis, appendicitis, okay? If it's on either side, you can think of kidney stones, and kidney stones, in patients with kidney stones, they tend to have this thing called a renal colicky kind of pain. Colicky, that means it calms and goes and waves. And the reason why it hurts is because your ureter is just filled with like the muscle, you know? Um, and it contracts against a stone and it causes trauma, it causes local inflammation. And sometimes with inflammation, you know, there's the cytokine release as well, et cetera, et cetera, TNF, IL-1, IL-6. And okay, gynecological uh, presentation, remember, always ask if it's a female, is there any chance you might be pregnant? Okay, so think about pregnancy, think about ectopic pregnancy, all right? And then you think about the left upper quadrant pain, splenic rupture. Spleen is, as we know by now, between the ribs T9 to T11, okay? So any trauma there. The spleen is very prone to, to rupture because of the sharp edges of the, um, of the uh, what do you call that, rib cage. But it's also important to note that in certain conditions, actually, like autolytic, uh, hemolytic, uh, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, it can cause, because the spleen is in charge of um, sequestration, right? And getting rid of those waste materials-ish. So when you place a lot of stress on it, uh, the spleen is enlarged. So in this patients, they've got splenomegaly. And when it's big, it's very like, I, would, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say brittle is the right word, but it's very prone to rupture. So just keep that in mind, okay? Now, suprapubic. Now I think, remember I, I told you to divide the body into nine quadrants? Now, suprapubic is just around the bladder area. So you'd be thinking about cystitis. I mean, what's cystitis? Cystitis is just inflammation of the bladder, okay? There's urinary retention as well. Okay, then you'd be thinking, how does urinary retention cause pain? Okay, think about it. When you hold your urine, it can cause a bit of um, discomfort. But that is, that is discomfort. It can cause pain. There's this thing called reflux nephropathy, where it causes urine to back up into your kidneys. Okay, uh, pregnancy, as mentioned, or pelvic inflammatory disease. Now, pelvic inflammatory disease is commonly caused by STIs, such as gonorrhea and chlamydia. Okay. Um, in terms of diffuse abdominal pain syndrome, something vague, you know, patient can't point out, you know, can you point out to me where's, where's your pres uh, presenting, uh, where's the pain? Uh, so doctor, I don't really know, is this all around? You'd be thinking, hmm, bowel obstruction. If you're thinking about bowel obstruction, it's good to ask, you know, uh, constitutional symptoms, any weight loss, night sweats, fever, um, you know, any issues with um, any blood in your stool? Yeah, all these questions, red flags here. Yeah talking about red flag stuff. Okay, think about irritable bowel uh, syndrome, okay? Or inflammatory bowel disease. You can also think about gastroenteritis or even constipation. Yeah, that's right. Constipation, fecal impaction. If you want to know one more differential on your right lower quadrant, <laughs> it's usually in children, you get this thing called mesenteric adenitis. <laughs> and it's usually caused by a viral infection. Uh, post viral post viral infection actually happens uh, I, from my understanding more than five to seven days, and then it causes inflammation of the mesenteric uh, um, lymph nodes in the right lower quadrant. Okay. Now, very very high yield stuff. Viral hepatitis. Okay, so I need you guys to put on your thinking caps and listen to me clearly. So viral hepatitis has five different viruses: Hep A, B, C, D, and E. Now, all five of the viruses belong to different families, and so they have completely different structures. However, some of them behave similarly. For example, hepatitis A and E are transmitted by a fecal oral route, have short incubation period, and causes self-limiting, uh, and is, it is a self-limiting illness that do not progress to chronic hepatitis. And it's also not associated, associated with hepatocellular carcinoma. In contrast, hepatitis B, C, and D, 
are transmitted via blood or other bodily fluids, have a long incubation period, and can cause illness that can progress to chronic hepatitis and are associated with HCC. Now, it is often thought that hepatitis A and E causes acute hepatitis, whereas hepatitis B, C, and D causes chronic hepatitis. This is true to a certain extent, but it's important to remember that hepatitis B, C, and D can also present acutely. Now, another point to note is that hepatitis D can only occur only when the individual has been infected with hepatitis B infection. Do you know why? Okay, allow me to tell you, because the hepatitis D virus needs to be coated with the hepatitis B antigen, HBSAG, okay? HBS antigen to enter the hepatocyte. Interesting, eh? Now, simultaneous infection with hepatitis B and hepatitis D can lead to hepatitis. But recovery is usually complete and development of chronic hepatitis D is quite rare, okay? So this is simultaneous infections, okay? However, 90% of those with a super infection of hepatitis D on chronic hepatitis B already, that means a person has been infected with hepatitis B already, chronic can develop chronic hepatitis D. I know there's a lot to go around, but don't stress too much. Um, result, and this could result in accelerated progression to cirrhosis, liver failure, and an increased risk of HCC, hepatocellular carcinoma. Now, hepatitis E is quite rare in Australia, so you don't really need to know much about it. Clinical features similar to hepatitis. In a majority of cases, disease is self-limiting and usually has complete recovery. However, in pregnant women, it has a mortality rate of 20 to 30% as it can present with fulminant hepatitis. What's fulminant hepatitis? It's just a rare syndrome of massive necrosis of liver parenchyma and a decrease in liver size, okay? Resulting in, um, it looks like an acute yellow atrophy. Now, the treatment is just supportive care in this case. There's no current, there is currently no hepatitis E vaccine available in Australia. Now, I'll discuss hepatitis A, B, and C in a little bit more detail. Now, hepatitis A, okay, is transmitted via fecal oral route through contaminated food, drinks such as shellfish or ice, especially in an endemic country. So it's very important in the OSCEs here when, for example, with the patients on a holiday trip to maybe Sri Lanka or something um, on, the, on, the, on the boat, it's important to ask, I'll say, oh, I've been drinking bottled water. I say, oh, but have you been having ice? You say, oh yeah, I've been having some of the cocktails, you see? So red flag, okay? So hepatitis A has a short incubation period of about two to six weeks. The clinical cause of any acute viral hepatitis can be divided into three phases, prodromal phase, icteric phase, and resolution of symptoms. Prodromal phase is about one to two weeks characterized by fever, malaise, nausea, vomiting, and right upper quadrant pain, okay? Remember I told you hepatitis, inflammation of the liver, inf um, you irritate the capsule, you get pain. Now that's a prodromal phase. Second phase, icteric phase, um, usually at about two weeks, characterized by jaundice, duck urine, pale stools, and pruritus, which is like just itchy skin, okay? Um, I hope you know the reason by now why you get duck urine, pale stool, duck urine, because there's heaps of conjugated bilirubin or bilirubin nemia, okay? Bilirubin in the blood, nemia. And poo, it's pale stool because lack of bowel. Now, the third phase is resolution symptom, resolution of symptoms. This is followed, uh, so usually you have to detect um, the anti-HAV IgM, anti-hepatitis A virus IgM, which is elevated during acute infection. And this confirms the diagnosis. Prodromal symptoms usually resolve within a few weeks. Jaundice usually resolves within one to three months and supportive care is recommended, okay? Now, hepatitis B and C, these are very big topics. But in summary, hepatitis B is mainly transmitted via blood, sexual intercourse, or perinatally to the baby. It has a long incubation period of about one to six months. And the clinical outcome of hepatitis B uh, virus infection depends on the age of the infection. So if, inf inf if infected under the age of five years old, Sym symptomatic acute disease is less likely to occur because you know the, the basically the body hasn't developed a, a, a good immune system to approach such problems but the likelihood of developing a chronic infection is very very high okay 30 to 90 percent due to the less likelihood of viral clearance conversely in individuals infected after the age of five they are more likely to be symptomatic okay but they have a lower chance of developing chronic infection so remember less than five years old less symptoms but chronic carriers, okay? But 
for ages above five years old, they get symptoms, but the chances of it being a chronic infection, very low, two to 10%. Clinical acute hepatitis B has a gradual onset with symptoms like those acute hepatitis A infection. Symptoms usually resolve about one to three months. Hence, treatment of acute hepatitis B is just supportive care. Um, however, in less than 5% of adults, it can progress to chronic hepatitis and become inactive, non-contagious carriers. Now, hepatitis B carry, carrier state is very, very common. Chronic hepatitis can reactivate, causing asymptomatic hepatitis, symptomatic hepatitis, or even acute liver failure. In about 20 to 30% of patients with chronic hepatitis B develop cirrhosis or hepatocellular carcinoma. But remember I told you, the scary thing about hepatitis B is that it doesn't need to develop into cirrhosis to cause hepatocellular carcinoma compared to hep C. So the, now the treatment for chronic hepatitis B consists of nucleotide or nucleoside analogs, okay? Such as tenovir, which is the adenosine 5-monophosphate analog, okay? Now, end-stage liver disease due to hepatitis B virus requires liver transplantation. In Australia, hepatitis B vaccination is strongly recommended for infants and children in a four-dose schedule, but you don't need to know that for that. Okay, the last thing, hepatitis C. I know there's a lot to take in, bear with me. So hepatitis C is transmitted primarily via blood, usually in our intravenous drug users, as a major risk factor. It has a long incubation period. Patients are asymptomatic in the acute phase, but may present with fever, malaise, fatigue, and jaundice. Unlike in hepatitis B, hepatitis C, up to 85% of the patients progress to get chronic hepatitis, and, and um, as asymptomatic patients are rarely diagnosed or treated. Hepatitis C carrier state is very common. Chronic hepatitis C can lead to cirrhosis or hepatocellular um, cellular carcinoma. Diagnosis is made on detection of anti-hepatitis C virus antibodies by serology and hepatitis C virus RNA by PCR. Acute hepatitis C virus is treated with IFN alpha or pegylated interferon alpha, okay? Now chronic hepatitis C infection is treated with a combination of two direct acting antivirals. With adequate treatment, up to 90% can be cured. However, there is unfortunately no hepatitis C vaccine available. And basically, um, the reason why is because I was, I was reading up, the reason why is number one, it's very difficult to, there's very high variability in the hepatitis C viral particles itself. And number two, it's very difficult to find animal models appropriate for hepatitis C. In addition to that, it's also very difficult to culture those, um, um, what do you call it, viral particles. In fact, this technology just recently became available a couple of years ago. So, so hopefully, you know, but we're moving towards the right direction. So hopefully they'll be able to come out with a vaccine soon, okay? Now, interpreting, this is the very high yield part. They will come for your exams, okay? Interpreting hepatitis B, Serology is a high yield topic. Hepatitis B serology consists of seven components which you need to know the significance of, okay? Hepatitis B, um, hepatitis B um, antigen, okay? Which is the marker of an, um, an infection. Anti-HBS, okay? Anti-HBS is basically just to see whether the person is recovered. Um, anti HBC IgM to show uh, basically an acute infection, anti HBC uh, IgG, which is a chronic infection. HBE is basically, uh, HBE marker is basically just to show um, an acute HBV infection. And anti HBC uh, IgG, it's a marker of past or chronic infection. Okay, so basically, all in all, um, wait, let me just stretch this out. Okay. Sorry. So, I'll repeat again, okay? Hepatitis B uh, antigen is used as a general marker for hepatitis B infection, okay? So, HBS antigen is used as a marker for HBS infection. Anti hepatitis B is used to document recovery and or immunity to hepatitis B infection, but also successful vaccinations. Anti HBC IgM is a marker of acute HBV infection. Anti HBC IgG is a marker of past or chronic infection. HBE antigen indicates active replication of HBV. Anti HBE indicates cessation, like 
stoppage of active replication. And HPV DNA basically indicates active replication of HPV. Um, usually we just use this to monitor response uh, to therapy. So now the definition of chronic infection is the persistence of uh, HBS antigens for more than six months. Okay, keep that in mind. And thus it is characterized by the inability to produce anti-HBS. So let's do the following exercises together, okay? So now we've got a patient with acute infection, all right? So acute infection, HBS antigen goes up, anti-HBS because there's no vaccination, anti-HBC IgM makes sense, acute infection, so tick. Anti-HBC IgG, nah, because it's an acute infection. HBE antigen goes up because remember, it's part of the replication process. Anti-HBE is nil because the thing is replicating literally. And HBV DNA is increased because you know, there is increased amount of DNA because the thing is just replicating. All right, next, resolved infection. Re what about resolved infection? So now would you find HBS antigen no, you won't because the person has been cured, right? Or what about anti-HBS? You'll find it, yes, it does go up. Anti-HBC IgM? Nah, because the person's no longer infected anymore, right? Past the acute phase. Anti-HBC IgG? Yes, it's increased. HBE antigen? No. HBE increased? Yep. And HBE DNA? No. So let's go through this. There we go, okay. So I just want all of you to just take a look at this. Uh, I know there's a lot to go through, but um, just remember this table, okay? It's very high yield and I'll pass this time to Reese right now. All right, I will share my screen. Okay. Um... Yeah, the last case is jaundice. In the inter interest of time, I'll just go through it really fast. I guess jaundice is yellowing of the skin and the uh, sclera of the eyes. Um, it happens when you have hyperbilirubinemia uh, more than twice or three times its normal limit. So about 50 uh, micromoles will do it. And you get... Uh, the yellowing of the eyes first before the skin because the bilirubin has more affinity for binding to the elastin in the sclera. Uh, if we move on, I guess the bilirubin metabolism, um, once red blood cells break down, the hemoglobin is stripped, so it uh, gets separated into the heme and the globin part, so globin uh, further breaks down to amino acids and it's recycled within the body. The heme can be uh, separated into, uh, by heme oxygenase to um, uh, iron and bilirubin and the iron can be recycled. Bilverdin is further um, oxidized to and conjugated bilirubin by bilirubin reductase, and that binds to albumin and gets transported to the liver. So in the liver, um, in the liver, unconjug unconjugated bilirubin uh, can go through this process where it becomes conjugated to glucuronic acid, and then it's um, secreted into the small intestine where the, the bacterial proteases are uh, converted to urobilinogen and it's further converted to serocobalin and 90% of this is uh, just excreted in the feces but 10% of urobilinogen is reabsorbed back into the system goes back into the liver around 2% of this goes into the kidney and it's produced in the urine, it's excreted in the urine, which gives it the uh, yellowish color. And the other 8% go through this process of conjugation and then being excreted into the small intestine again. Uh, so I guess when you have jaundice, there are several differential diagnoses. Um, it could be, uh, so you can divide that into three different uh, mechanisms, prehepatics, um, hepa intrahepatic and posthepatic. So I guess it, talks about the causes of it, prehepatic malaria, destroying red blood cells, sickle cell anemia, thalassemia, septicemia, and G6PD deficiency. Intrahepatic, it, there's, I guess, problems with the conjugation of it, so viral hepatitis, alcoholic hepatitis, autoimmune, and then uh, lithic cancer. Post-hepatic is when the bilirubin, I guess, can't get into the small intestine. It could be due to some blockage, due to cholelithiasis, cholangiocarcinoma, pancreatic cancer, or some form of pancreatitis. Um, 
So in terms of chronic liver disease and cirrhosis, chronic liver disease is disease of liver that lasts longer than six months, and it can be caused by chronic viral hepatitis, NASH, or alcoholic liver disease, or other insults to the liver like paracetamol and other drugs. Clinical features is usually obstruction of blood flow through the liver and reduction of liver function, which is shown through the testing of LFTs. It has a whole range of um, symptoms affecting all systems, but I'll just move on from this. Uh, it's sort of part of the GI exam, but in the interest of time, I'll move on. Uh, I'll just go through NASH briefly. It's essentially a non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. What happens, as Sean explained before, during the pathology bit, it's accumulation of excess fat in the liver. And we know fat is inflammatory, so in excess fat in the liver causes oxidative stress and uh, there's macrophage activation and production of inflammatory cytokines. And that's where the bit in the pathology, you get ballooning happening in the hepatocytes and eventually you get scarring and fibrosis of the liver, which can further on develop into hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, in terms of management of uh, cirrhosis, it depends, I guess, on what's causing it and what sort of symptoms it's showing. If it's caused by uh, viral hepatitis, you would want to vaccinate for that or treat um, the hepatitis for, uh, with antivirals. If it's caused by alcohol, you want to abstain from alcohol. You want the person to be uh, up to date with their vaccinations and uh, avoid hepatotoxins, like any drugs that they're taking that might cause damage to the liver, so activation of cytochrome P450 pathway, reduce it or stop it if you can't reduce it at all. And then you would want to manage the symptoms of the chronic liver disease and the cirrhosis, which is ascites, which is accumulation of fluid in the uh, peritoneal region. Um, what you could do is use diuretics to get rid of the fluid, or if it's really severe, you can do an acidic tap. Uh, you would want to treat hyponatremia, which is caused by the cirrhosis of the liver. It's due to increased vasodilation. So it's essentially, you'd want to stop the vasodilation. You can give uh, the beta blockers, or what you could do is try to use diuretics to re reduce the excess fluid in the body and then bring the sodium levels back to normal. Uh, thrombocytopenia or elevated INR, what you could do with this is do a bit of transfusion of platelets or give vitamin K to improve clotting symptoms. Uh, other complication of cirrhosis is variceal bleeding and hepatocellular carcinoma. Variceal bleeding, everyone should be monitored for it. And you could do this by scope, like a gastroscopy, and try to ligate any possible variceals that might bleed. Hepatocellular carcinoma, what you could do is do six monthly uh, ultrasound monitoring of the liver to see if there is any structural changes. And then there's the other complication, hepatic encephalopathy, which you need to address. But eventually, people through cirrhosis, some of them do progress to hepatocellular carcinoma. So you need to be worried of decompensated liver function and sort of refer the patient for to be in the wait list for liver transplant transplantation. Yep, the next bit is the GI exam. Do you want to take this one and do the promotion at the end? All right. Oh, I mean, we've got Vanessa over here. Okay, let's yeah. just... All right. Um, okay. Do you want to just open your slide? Yeah, okay. Right. Yeah, just, just open your thing. We just keep this really informal. <laughs> so, all right, GI exam. How you stuff? Metabolic flare. Ask the patient to hold out there for 15 seconds. And he'll literally just do this. He's keep moving because um, if you want to know the mechanism, it's very niche, but uh, it's caused by Alzheimer's type two uh, glial cells, but you don't need to know that. <laughs> um, ba basically it's accumulation of like ammonia um, or hypercapnia, so high CO2 in the brain and can cause uh, basically this proliferation of the Alzheimer type two glial cells. But you honestly don't need to know that, okay? Now, what are the findings that you see? Spider nevi. And spotted nevi usually follows the superior vena curva um, distribution. And remember to inspect the back of the patient as well, okay? Now you like to, you want to position the patient flat on the uh, bed, or get him to lie down with one pillow, drop his pants just right to the hip bone, arms to the side and legs crossed. Uh, before you commence the um, examinations, I think it's really important. Now, it is very important to ask the patient whether he's in any pain. So that's where you can palpate that area, the last, the last quadrant. So start palping, uh, palpating away from the pain and then move towards it. Start with light palpation, followed by deeper palpation. And always keep an eye out for the patient's uh, face because you can just, you know, when you 
palpate in a certain quadrant and the patient just squirms, that's when you know, hey, the person is actually in pain. You know, ask them, you can, that's when you can identify which quadrant there's a pathology at. So um, you want to do some deep palpation, light palpation followed by deep palpation. And then you want to palpate for the liver and spleen by asking the patient to breathe in when you're pushing into the abdomen with your edge at the hand, okay? And do not move your hand, okay? I think this is really important. Just place your hand over there, get him to take a deep breath in. When there's increased, uh, what do you call that, uh, intrathoracic pressure, it just pushes the liver down. When it hits your hand, if a person has acute um, cholecystitis, for example, it hurts and you just squirm, okay? Now, the liver span, classic. Do the um, percussion until it becomes dull. Get him to, get patient to place his index finger on that margin and then ask him to hold it there. Continue percussing from um, supraclavicular downwards until you can find um, an area of dullness and then you just measure the whole area, okay? Normal span should be about 12 to 13 centimeters, all right? Um, and then you want to palpate for the kidneys. So remember, anterior hand at the top and then feel for the kidneys below. Remember the kidneys are closer to the, to the vertebra, okay? T9 to T12, okay? Just, just around there, just below. Just make sure you feel for it and get it to push it, push up again to your hand. And um, yeah, answer the questions in a systematic way. Okay, when the patient asks you, when the examiner asks you, so what are your findings? I say, I had the pleasure of, you know, doing performing an examination on Miss CC. There's a 45 year old lady came in with uh, jaundice, you know, for example, on examination, uh, on, on inspection, she said, blah, 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 you know, on power patient, you have blah, blah, blah. Other than that, the other findings were unremarkable. That's about it. Yeah, so yeah, end of the case, and yeah, I'm sure all of you are going to do amazing. All those that are watching the recordings, <laughs> so don't stress too much. Uh, this is uh, Mujis. This is our um, society. That's me, Reese, and amazing other uh, XCOM members. And yeah, next slide, please. <laughs> so yeah, I hope <laughs> we've um, helped you out. So yeah, thank you, guys. Nice. <laughs>